All right, welcome to this special session of SETS where we've got all of the interested parties in records and tuples in one place. Um, we left off last week having made some progress on at least understanding the scope of the problem and the natures of the trade-offs. Um, and who would like to take it away from here? I nominate Nicolo. Okay, so mm. last week we ended up agreeing that uh, with the current uh, like membrane implementations, it's not possible to have type of anything different from object. Uh, did you did you hear the notification? I should try to silence that. But anyway, uh, however, having type of objects. Uh, brings up other problems, which are uh, how to handle them in Wikimax and in proxies. And it would be possible to make them not throw in Wikimax and to make them not throw in proxies by just making them behave as regular objects. But I'm not sure that this is what everyone wants. And also having them a uh, type of object poses the question about what to do with the quality. And um, if, if like we are willing to have triple equal an object that is to be different, or if we need to somehow change uh, our quality definition. And so this is the problem space where, where we are exploring and where we will easily need to find a solution. At least this is how I think we ended up in last call. So a cl clarification there, the, the type of um, object, so the, the membrane issue that you mentioned um, that could potentially be solved by putting type of object is only if the record and tuple can have boxes on it. So if there is no boxes on, then then that that's not really an issue. All right. Yes. Well, I, I think there is three really clear different options. One is records and tuples as primitive without uh, boxes, so that no authority can be nested within a primitive. Um, records and tuples and boxes all as type of objects. Um, so we continue to hold the current case where on authority can only be nested within something that has type of object. And the third option is willingly breaking that uh, and potentially breaking uh, code that depends on this behavior that uh, there is a um, authority that is nested within uh, something that is not type of object. Um, so you're talking about like three specific options. Can I step back a bit and sort of come at it from a more high level, like first principles thing? So the language has a number of axioms that apply that, that are uh, potentially apply to every use case, right? There are maybe some people who don't care about them, but like any part of JavaScript is eligible to, to rely on these axioms. Uh, for example, object parens x triple equals x is only true for objects when x is an object. It is false when x is a primitive. That's an axiom. We cannot ever break that for any reason. It will make the language more confusing. Uh, so there's a lot of other things that I would put in that list of axioms. One is that if two things, if x and y are objects and they are uh, triple equals, they must not be distinguishable. They are the same object. Uh, Jordan, so that is another axiom in the language. Well, let me just ask for terminology clarification. Yeah. Uh, if what, you, what you mean by axiom seems identical to what Yuli and I mean by invariant. Are you making a distinction? Yes. Yes. Uh, I mean, invariant, whether explicitly documented and agreed to or not. Yeah. Right. That's what, that's what it means, is yep. things that are invariant that code might count on, our desire is to document them but they're considered sure. to be invariants before we, even before we document them. Then I'll, I'll switch from axiom to invariant because that, that is indeed what I mean. So um, there was the one about object X triple equals X tells you if it's a primitive or an object, that's an invariant. 
uh, if x triple equals y and x and y are both objects, well, x can only triple equal y if they're both objects or both primitives. And if they are both objects, x triple equals y means that they are the same object and they cannot be distinguished between. I think that is also an invariant that exists. Um, the, there's probably a number of others that you know, I could go through, but I, I suspect we'd all agree that yes, these are current invariants. Um, the one that I think this group feels very strongly about and uses, but isn't quite as universal, if maybe like that may not even have use cases outside of this call, is the mental model that uh, something being primitive means it has no mutable state associated with it and something being an object means that maybe it does. I, that is true at the moment. So you could argue that's an invariant, but that I think well, it would be a difficult argument that, uh, that code authored by people who aren't sharing this call's concerns uh, actually ever has that mental model. And so, let me get let me like, give a counter, a counter example that you're aware of that was please. Found, yeah. the counter example was found in, in response to your challenge. Yeah, uh, is um, I, I took a look at um, uh, our own coded agoric uh, for uh, places where we were counting on uh, this invariant, and I found one that has nothing to do with authority per se. Uh, mm -hmm. It was just a cycle check. Is I wanted to know if the reachability graph rooted in a particular object had cycles in it. And when I encountered a primitive, I just skipped further investigation because I know, I know that a primitive can't lead to a pointer uh, back into the graph. Uh, records and tuples by themselves uh, don't violate that. Records and tuples with boxes do violate that. Uh, and yeah, records, thank you for reminding if, me. I'm sorry, if records and tuples are primitive, then they then records and tuples with boxes violate that because uh, that traversal code would see, oh, this is a primitive, skip it, and mix the fact that the box tied together a cycle. Right. So thank you for reminding me of that. That is um, the cycle checks in, particularly in JSON.stringify is like the built-in version of that. Uh, that that is a use case. Um, now, I, I'm, I would still be interested in further investigation there to see if somebody, like I think that, that everyone on this call and in associated code bases has the curse of knowledge about uh, lots of things. And so I would be very uh, persuaded by examples of code with that care that uh, where the intention of the code is to think about carrying mutable state in such a way that records and tuples with boxes would break it. Uh, if those examples exist in code authored by someone who doesn't have the curse of knowledge that all of us, us in this call share. Um, now that doesn't erase the use case or the breakage. It just, I'm just like, mm -hmm. um, it, it's just discussing about the widespreadness of the damage. Mm -hmm. And I think that in the list of invariants, that one will probably have the least widespread damage out of all of them. It, if we pick one to break, and if oh, we break I, none of them, I, I like we 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 you have to look not just at how often it's used, but what the consequences sure. are of breaking it, and the consequences totally of breaking this one are pretty damn severe. Uh, but if all of the folks on this call are aware of that yeah, well in okay. advance, what would be the okay. actual effect of damage? Sorry, Ashley, mm -hmm. I think you had your hand up. Yeah, I'll be quiet. Yeah, sure, Ashley. Yeah, I just want to ask if. We had, uh, I think we all have a, a lot of shared agreement, but where it might get more gray is when something stops being an invariant and is just uh, like a consequence. As in, I agree that there are invariants in the language, but then there might be other things that are true and break, but aren't necessarily an invariant. As in, you could say that someone had code where they assumed the set of strings returned from type of was fixed in stone and would never update. And then obviously big n comes along. So it was like, was 
the set of things returned from type of an invariant or was it just a consequence of the language? And does that depend on uh, the, yeah, like I think is what Mark was saying, the things which are crucially important just because of how wide spread they are versus um, things that so someone, you know, someone somewhere could have a type of where they, the default case is to throw and they, you know, was that an invariant just because someone did it out there and we can find a website that does it. So yeah, so do we have a clear understanding of when an invariant, how can we just, uh, you know, separate things in the language into the things which are invariants and the things which may be true today, but might not be true in the future. And maybe that is what Mark was saying about the consequence of breaking it. I, I think I would uh, share, I think uh, there's a strong chance that nodes util inspect, which was not written by anybody in this room, depends on that, inv the invariant in particular. Um, uh, Rick, you have your hand. Um, yeah, I guess I, I'm trying to relate this back to um, Jordan's point overall, um, because we're right that like, I mean, well, the real answer is that anyone can claim an invariant about anything. And the real answer is we have to come to a consensus on the fact that an invariant is truly invariant, given that the alternative is some sort of disastrous outcome that the community doesn't want to have, right? I'm sorry, we have to come to consensus on breaking an invariant. We don't have yes, to yes. come to consensus on preserving it. Yes. Well, I, yeah, half a dozen the other, right? Like, if we preserve it, then we're not breaking it. But if we come to a consensus that we're breaking it, we're implicitly coming to the consensus that that breakage is worth it. Like it is not too dangerous. And Jordan's original argument being that the, like uh, that the, because the amount of lines of code is like in use cases is relatively small that it's lower risk, which is true in a sense. Um, and then, but Jordan makes a really interesting sub point that the entire subset of people who might care about this is in this call. Um, there is certainly a way to solve this problem such that you are aware of the known set of um, like possible type of values. So it seems feasible that in, in like cases like this, we could simply update these instances to fix this problem ahead of time, right? So, so first of all, I find it implausible that everybody who, who would be broken by this is on this call or is thinking about security. I think the, the cycle check is, is a great example of something that I wasn't even thinking of until I went to look for it. Uh, and um, the number of ways one can, uh, one can count on something being primitive, implying some things, uh, and then have that break, uh, I think is... Um, I, th I think that the cases that we found are symptomatic of a problem, um, and the problem can be can be widespread and hard to detect. Uh, yeah, I guess I guess saying the words "heart entire set" is is maybe a bit of a strong assertion. I guess if I'm to make the same argument, it's that like the majority is the case. But I mean, we I guess that requires a like a um, a, a counterexample where somebody like where this exists as prevalent in the wild and. Then it comes down to like, do we think this invariant is truly something people consider an invariant? Um, I, I don't know how to answer that question. Yeah, I think, I think in general with the invariants, the, uh, the, the frequent case that we need to be thinking about as language designers is where somebody's counting on the invariant without the invariant being articulate in their head as, oh, this is an invariant of language. But rather, it's just a regularity that, that they happen to be counting on. Uh, and even if you ask them, like I was, I think I was the one who authored the cycle checking code. If you ask them, are you counting on it? They might have authored code that counts on it and not remember that they were counting on it because it wasn't an articulate understanding. And then if you ask them if you care about their invariant, they might say no, even though they've written and deployed code that actually would break. Um, yeah, Chris, I think 
I'll pass it off to Bradley since he probably has something to follow up. He just raised his hand on this. Yeah, um, I think the object crawling is an interesting thing. I'm more worried about serialization and what people are gonna do with that. Um, if no matter what we do with these, I think serialization is gonna break in some way. Uh, naive serializers are gonna use type of and determine how they're gonna serialize things. Um, so I'm not sure we, we should just say there's only two use cases that we know of. Um, I could probably go and think of arbitrarily many number of use cases where people are using type of. They use it for more than just, you know, cycle checks and things like that. So uh, uh, just be aware of that while we're discussing. Don't, don't ever go down the route of we've encountered all the use cases. Yeah. Wait. Yeah, so if I may, um, I, I, I just wanted to try to reason on this problem space from um, more on who's going to be impacted by uh, what we decide to break here. And if we decide to break the type of uh, invariant uh, that this group uh, is concerned about, effectively, um, I think there, I'm, I'm not going to uh, pretend anything about the set of people that are going to be uh, impacted, but there is a high likeliness that this is going to impact people that are working on platforms or actually code that is going to run other people's code. And that is where the main concerns uh, are going to be. Um, and so there, there is, there is a, I, I mean, for me, a strong intuition that the people that are going to write platform code uh, are going to uh, control, for example, the engine that they're going to uh, run with. And so they are going to be able to follow the different features that are going to uh, be integrated uh, into the different releases of, um, of the engine. So I don't know if there is a way from uh, either TC39 or even implementers implementing the spec to signal to those infrastructure uh, uh, pro provider, I would say, that th there is something to be careful about. Uh, that being said, I again, I don't know what JavaScript code is there in the world. Uh, maybe there is some uh, more application facing code that's probably going to break, but I have more the intuition that if we make records being a uh, type of object, for example, uh, that we might uh, end up hurting uh, application code uh, or at least uh, people writing application codes compilation uh, more than the uh, alternative. So, yeah. Okay, quick reply. Um, this is not only platform code executing other code, it is also libraries used by yep. code okay. that may not be uh, where you cannot push an update to unless the uh, of course directly updates and, and and to and to Bradley's point uh, this might also break in the other situation as well you, you could break library code if you make record uh, return type of object right and <clears throat> so yeah it's just uh, trying to state that uh, yeah, exactly. What Jordan is saying in the chat, I guess, is, is exactly uh, the, the same kind of breakage you could expect. The, the, the thing is, yeah, just I'm finishing my point fast. Um, but the thing is, if you have old library code running in an old application, that old application is also unlikely to introduce records into tuples, right? Um, and yeah, that's, uh, that's it. Well, that's, that's, that's I think, what, what we're saying is that even in that case, if the consumer of a library is using record and tuple and the library wasn't designed to support records and tuples, then you, you ended up having a, a potential problem yeah, there. But, but would, would you, I mean, uh, if I were in that case, for example, I would try to uh, either vendor the library in my code base and, and make it support it or find an alternative. Um, yeah. 
but the okay, problem with yeah, library is not library maintainers not updating it. It's people updating the maintained version to the uh, to the latest version. It's both. Um, you know, there there's uh, you know lo lots of libraries yeah. that are widely used. They're no longer actively maintained, and they're considered to be robust and correct. And breaking those in the uh, is is something that we need to take seriously. Okay, uh, I'll let Nicolo uh, maybe either answer to that or add to this. Yes, thanks. So yeah, I think we should be really careful to differentiate between things that will be broken regardless of the type of and things that will be broken with a specific type of. Because for example, I believe both the cycle detector and the serialization use case would be broken regardless of the type of. And the reason is that when you like when you check for cycles, you currently never call functions. So even if boxes were objects, you would not call the unbox function, and so you would not detect the cycle. And for for the serialization one, probably you would be able to serialize it, like as if it was an object. But then you wouldn't be able to deserialize it back anyway, because you wouldn't know how to build back a record if it's serialized as an object. So like we should yep. be careful to not like mix the generic problem and the problem specific to type of. I think generalizing that into an invariant that maybe doesn't exist is that, or maybe a claim that you could make that this invariant doesn't exist, that the set of primitives that the language has stays the same, right? Like for the serializer case, your serializer is broken if big int is added to the language also, right? Because you can't see you have to, you can't know that uh, how to serialize a big int if you only have, know how to serialize numbers, right? Big ints and symbols have already established that the, the list of type of values must not be relied upon being fixed. Like, well, right. You could like, maybe but, argue that, uh, that but, object but, and function are the only to take it even, ones. Right, but to take it even one step further, it, it's, it's not just primitives that could like have authority via this indirect pointer to a object, it's any primitive that could break this invariant. So like this oh. variant is less strong in that sense, I guess. Yeah, so, so, so the, the issue of reasoning about invariants uh, is somewhat sensitive to the issue of what precedents programmers are aware of that helps, that helps shape what they consider to be invariants. And speaking as a user of the language, um, the, I'm aware that the type of, of primitives has expanded over time, but the type of, of objects has not. I'm also aware that there's uh, the type of objects is a short list to where I can uh, sort of notationally afford to write type of X is not equal to object and type of X is not equal to function, but I'm not going to similarly list all of the types of, of primitives if I want to check for a primitive. Um, uh, so that's, that's why there's widespread code that checks against object or function to make the distinction, is it an object versus is it a primitive? Um, uh, primitives themselves have a sufficiently uniform behavior right now that uh, for much code, not for all code, but for much code, uh, adding new primitive types with new type ofs uh, has been something we've been able to survive. And each one has been you know, a gamble. Uh, but of all of the record and tuple proposals, the one that I have the most confidence would not break things uh, um, uh, is that uh, additional, is that records and tuples become primitives that can only contain primitives uh, and that they have new type ofs, uh, record and tuple respectively. Uh, that will break some things, but I think it'll, it'll do the least damage to existing code. I mean, I, you, I think you're correct in that like removing box does solve this invariant, but I don't think that the overwhelming consensus is that we want to remove boxes. Like I think boxes are extremely important part of the proposal. So I- So, so Matteo was, was arguing the same, right? Do you wanna explain why, why you think boxes should be included? Matthew? Um, 
I think from an, from reading some of the use cases, VDOM and so on, it, it feels like the overarching uh, use of boxes is really to be able to clearly identify that there's a place in the record or tuple structure uh, where there is data associated, um, which you cannot, you would have to do awkwardly uh, with a side table. Side table, if you have a symbol, symbol can be used for something else. So you also have to include some other kind of data indicating at which path um, that symbol is there. Or you have to like do something awkward, like finding all symbols in your record tuple and, um, uh, and, and compare it to an entry in your, uh, in, in your symbol set. Uh, it's, it's basically awkward. So, I, so, uh, so Mark, how does this there. relate to your comment where you were encouraging oh, oh, boxes so, to be removed? So my comment uh, was not uh, advocacy. It was an observation. Uh, the, uh, we're discussing invariance and, and breakage and, and, and hazards on existing code. And I, the observation I was making is that records and tuples as primitives with new type of types uh, is the one that has the least hazard. Now, the direction that we've pursued as we've discussed this, um, uh, I think the records and tuples as, box, as, as objects uh, 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 so that they can contain boxes as objects, uh, I think is still something that has attractions, but I take Jordan's, Jordan's observation about other breakage very seriously. So, uh, so I'm, I'm stating the observation that the position that has the least breakage hazard is primitives with no boxes. And then uh, for the other ones, uh, they have more breakage hazard and that needs to be taken into account in deciding what to do. Yeah. I would actually say that like the example of serializers is, uh, is one where primitives would break a little bit more than um, than type of object, uh, since a serializer with type of object would just end up parsing it as if it was a regular object, and you just wouldn't be able to unserialize it to a record, but you would unserialize it to a regular object. So, so Bradley, you raised serialization. What do you think the implications for serialization are? Um, pretty much whenever you introduce a new type, you're going to break serializers, which is why they're great to use as an example, because they're going to break in both cases. Um, if you want something to be preserved as a record type across serialization, that's kind of uncommon. Um, usually once you deserialize something, you don't want to control it. Um, so I'd agree with Matthew that type of object is probably less likely to break stuff uh, because you'll actually send the data across the wire at least in that case. Uh, with primitives, it'll probably be dropped or throw. Um, in the case of JSON parse, it's probably going to end up, or stringify, it's probably going to end up with a drop for most things. The language itself might support it, but that's unlikely, I feel like we'd never really update json.parse or stringify. Oh, I, I think we were thinking specifically for records and tuples that they would support json stringify, whether or not we go with object or, or primitive. I would certainly think so as well. I, would I think, I I think that's already part of the spec well, text. It, they just it's wouldn't not a, round it's trip. It's not necessarily. Like, yeah, they just don't I round don't... trip back. But they, but they, they stringify whether or not we go with object or, or primitive. That's not like a. I don't difference. think it's important for us to discuss that here because I think saying that the language can update itself is exactly kind of the problem going on. We're talking about the language. There are people. NPM does not use JSON stringify, and it is one of the heavy hitters that uses JSON every day. Um, so. Uh, I'm wondering for people who support box 
and type of object, which I guess includes Mathieu and, and uh, Bradley. What do you think about the invariance that Jordan is positing? Like, how should we be making this trade-off? My opinion is what Jordan stated in uh, in chat. There, you either canonicalize can uh, minus zero to plus zero, or um, you make them differentiated to triple 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 equal. Uh, uh, my that, stance is that lesser. only fixes. Sorry, my stance is lesser. I can deal without having box. It's just a really painful developer experience because I've done it for years. It's it's not pleasant and it's buggy. Uh, so Jordan's Jordan's also encouraged us to allow everything to be weak map keys, which Bradley is encouraged uh, that we don't do um, because it, it could lead to memory leaks. So, I, I mean, I wonder if we could, you know, since there are many different proposals floating around about how to change semantics, if maybe like you could, you could work out some kind of compromise position because I'm personally, I'm personally okay with many different points on this kind of spectrum. Um, I know a lot of other people have opinions and can we work out like a common common point in the middle? I mean, my objection about weak map keys and stuff is, is bearable. We're, we're already have memory leaks from other categories. I just have stated that we're gonna see it really quick. Yeah. Bradley, you have more experience uh, in the realm of tooling for that. Um, how feasible and how much of a uh, mitigation do you think it would be for developer tooling to warn the developer when they've added a, um, an object that doesn't bear identity to a weak map? As a form of you messed up. You're saying if records and tuples are objects, then so a record or tuple that doesn't have that doesn't contain a box or that if we decide box con contain non uh, identity objects. Um, so if you put a record and tuple in it, but that doesn't carry within it an object with identity, so that the record or tuple doesn't have an identity by itself. Um, if you add that to a weak map, basically worn in uh, developer tooling. So, I mean, um, I can answer that. That defeats the whole point. Every, well, the, no. The, um, well, for, for my use cases, every time I'm doing it, as I have to write special case code, the my my preference is I just want an optimistically weak map. I want it to be weak when possible, and I don't care if it's strong when not. I want something I can stick everything in and will hold on to the least memory possible. And so. so if get I spanned. get, you'll get spammed in your developer tooling. But yeah. if you want to update your code to be more uh, uh, responsible, sorry, I don't have a better word. Uh, you can update it uh, because you the language will also provide the tool to make for you to make that check and avoid uh, putting it in there. Yeah, I could, but then, but the the point is that it's not irresponsible because I don't care that the that the, the other things are held onto. I just whenever possible. I want things to be. I think there's out. some confusion here. Uh, there's also a hand up. Thanks. I was just going to say really quickly that just I don't know, I'm very slow with these things. So you might have to help me along for the use case where someone wants an optimistic weak map. In my mind, I would create you know, a, a wrapper where I have two. I have a weak map and a normal map. I try and put something in the weak map. If that froze, I put it in a map. And then, you know, I have the usual, the same interface. But is that, um, that feels like something that we could be solved in user land, but maybe so, I'm missing something. Yeah, there, there, this is actually an interesting data point, which is for, for essentially this reason, I actually have written a map abstraction that does that, but rather than try catch, <laughs> what it does is it says, if it's an object, use it, use, it, use it as a key in a weak map, otherwise use it as a key in a map. 
<laughs> so, yeah, so this yeah, case we, itself we, becomes we, another example. We do something like that in in uh, in our our virtual object schema. I think so we're trying to jump. We've written it twice. I think we're trying to jump too hard on solving something that's potentially better solved not at runtime. Um, so we have various kinds of type checkers, linters, and stuff like that. And you can just lint and see if they're trying to put something into a weak map usually these days. Um, warn there, rather than writing a bunch of code, because people can do it intentionally. There are use cases for it. There's no reason for us to prevent doing it except concerns about memory leaks, which I think are bearable, just unfortunate. So, yeah. Actually, that actually does raise a good question. Um, would most tooling be updatable to uh, deal with record and tuples at, um, as objects, uh, yeah, without confusing it with regular objects? They're basically still able to differ differentiate them from, uh, from regular objects. Uh, narrowing with things like TypeScript or Flow is not you would suddenly have everything that is guaranteed to be a type that is object no longer have that guarantee. This, if type of is object, you're, you're changing their types. Would be good. But I mean, I think, I think narrowing is like in a type system, I think you, it would work the same. It would probably, my guess is it would be more complex if it's type of object, but I would want someone on the TS team to confirm that either way. But like, it feels like in either case, a type system could distinguish and without a type system, you cannot distinguish. So a linter cannot do anything, only a type checker could, but I think it could do the same in either type of case. There you are could, some uh, yeah. integrations between type systems and linters these days. So. Well, yeah, you can, yeah, I mean, there, there are ESLint but, rules that will consume the TypeScript type checker, but like generally, the, like you have to be using a type a local, to do that. Local semantic analysis will not tell you, like unless you're like, it's local to the function. The yeah, second you escape, it's, you can't do it. The same as a linter will not prevent you from putting a primitive in a weak map. Right. Correct. But type trip will because the type of the first argument is not a, it's not a primitive. It's an object. You can opt out of that yeah. without think, writing if else's. You just tell TypeScript it's OK. Sure, it would, sure, sure, sure. It would be good to uh, ask the question to a TypeScript implementer. Uh, I don't think anyone is on the call or has been involved in these discussions. I mean, I'm, I'm working, I'm not on the TypeScript team, obviously, but I have spent the whole week working on the TypeScript compiler, so. Right, so I mean, in terms of the, the TypeScript tracking it, I, I think it, it could track certain things, but of all things with TypeScript, it's always a trade-off of when they could be more accurate about something the problem with accuracy comes from you then start to have false positives and they could start complaining about something incorrectly. Like, you know, they could go, oh, it's not possible to tell if this is a, a record with a box or just a, a record of anything in it. So it could assume it could have a box and fail for those cases because it thinks that's the safer thing to do, or it could think that's going to cause too many people an error. It's actually going to, like, they don't want, TypeScript doesn't, you know, have any guarantees about being sound, you know, so it's always a trade off of like how much an error is going to really help people versus sure. how much it's going to get in the way rather than what's possible technically. And I, that's I don't a hard think we value judgment to make. I, I think that at like as Reckoner Tubal hits stage three and TypeScript starts implementing this stuff, you know, we'll, we'll have to involve the TypeScript team a lot to like figure out how this will mesh together. But I don't think we need to, like a guarantee that this is going to mesh well. Um, because the TypeScript type system being unsound means that there's just so, so many opportunities for different ways to hack around this that like, I'm not, right. it's not as big of a concern to me. And I um, think thinking about this anyway, uh, it would be a problem regardless of the type of um, issue. Yeah, like, like the general topic of ensuring the, like, the box being there is part of the type, them needing to infer that is important regardless. Um, I, do we want to loop it back to 
the other blocking invariant for objects still being the um, fact that triple equal um, does not stay the same for ob as object it is under the current equality semantics. So I want to ask a procedural question since it's my job to facilitate, it seems like a good <laughs> um, Dude, does everyone here agree that it would be a useful way to conduct the conversation about records and tuples to, in terms of what breaks for each of the options so that we can then, after we've collected a collection of, of what breaks for each option, weigh that um, against our values? Is that, is it, because I think that what I'm hearing from Jordan at, from, from the beginning of this call is that um, uh, is a reaction to our consensus from the last meeting that, uh, that one of the options has sufficiently condemning properties because it breaks things that this group of people cares about deeply, an invariant this group cares about deeply that it is not an option on the table and that we can make progress sort of dynamically off of that. But uh, that, uh, we, uh, that, that I think Jordan's call is for us to uh, more holistically evaluate how bad each, uh, all three of the options that we're investigating are. As Mark said, the least bad is obvious, but also the least palatable because it gives us the least expressivity um, and et cetera, et cetera. So if we could, um, use the remaining time. Do, does everybody agree we could best use the rest of this the time in this meeting review, uh, just coming up with what is the worst thing that happens? What is the worst consequence of each of these options? And then start actually digging into the ones that we've discussed the least, which are things like the object in it, uh, object equality and variance, et cetera. I would go, I, I, so I like that. I would put a fourth option on the table uh, not because I'm in favor of it, but because uh, it is one of the things that might that we might end up doing, which is just not doing records and tuples at all. That obviously does the least damage. Uh, and, and so the pros and cons of that should be weighed against the other three. Yeah, I think that that actually goes without saying that um, sure. we clearly do the least damage by doing nothing, that you cannot break the web by doing nothing. <laughs> um, but thank you for reminding. That definitely is uh, on the table. Uh, I see Nicolo's hand. Yeah, so I, do we, like in the this nine history, has there haven't been like a way to evaluate how bad some breakage is? Because like, for example, Mark mentioned that it's not enough to just see how much code is broken because some breakages might be worse than others. So did we ever have like some way to evaluate this, even just by like a framework to talk about that. Yeah, yeah. As, as, as Jordan and I were going back earlier on the call about what, what, what kinds of cases may be consequential. Um, and uh, one of the things that I'd observe about that is that uh, there are pieces of code that, that folks on this call are intimately familiar with um, that no one else, that very few people off of this call are intimately familiar with, um, but are no less consequential because they are baked into the lowest layers of the most primitive libraries that absolutely everything uses. Um, and, uh, and, and that certainly is like, if, if there's one library that everyone uses, I think that that is of more consequence. Um, and we just need to have like some concrete evidence. In terms of, um... Discovering those, um, Ashley, I don't know if you, the, the laboratory thing you shared doesn't just give us exactly those answers, like enumerating through those things. I don't know if y'all have played with it, um, but like going there and switching the various options will give us the enumeration of all possible breakages, right? It will tell you. I think Ashley's tool was great. Um, however, having come to the discussion on records and tuples a little late. I am mass missing a lot of the background on the equality discussion. And that thread is very, very long and I'm declaring bankruptcy on it. Um, I, if same value zero is not possible, I, I, 
I believe same value zero is not possible for type of uh, objects. Um, I'd like to understand how it came to the conclusion that same value zero was what we wanted and if another alternative would be acceptable or if they're all uh, off the table. Yes, yeah, so I can. So for the, for the history of the same value zero equality semantics, uh, you know, that was, a, that was quite a lengthy discussion and there, there were, the proposal initially started with just same value semantics. The triple equal would be the same as object that is, that there wouldn't be canonicalization. Uh, we heard a lot of complaints from, from uh, web developers. I mean, I guess, especially from, from Gus Kaplan and uh, maybe people who, who he invited to the, these forums. And uh, people were saying, but I think Kevin Gibbons was also sympathetic uh, and other people. And uh, people were saying that this would create extra developer friction for developers to have to start caring about the difference between zero and negative zero through triple equals, through, uh, through records and tuples. Uh, I, I would be okay personally with going back to the original equality semantics, but I think if we want to make that change, we would want to bring in the the stakeholders who had that other point of view. We have very extensive GitHub threads and you can figure out who to get in touch with through that. I, could someone, if they remember, uh, summarize what the argument against canonization was? Uh, the argument against canonicalization was that uh, it's, it's, I mean, I, I believe this argument actually, uh, you, it's weird if we have a container data structure and you put something in the data structure and take it out and it's different. I just don't expect, you know, the operation of making a tuple of something and then taking it out to change what the value is. It is important to notice that sets and maps do that right now. Yeah, and I was and gonna, I, like, I think you, you take it out, not the same, but only by object dot is a check. Correct. I want to just add real quick. I have a package called is negative zero. It gets 16.3 million downloads a week. So I, I don't know how strong a claim it is that developers don't ever have to deal with the difference. <laughs> yeah. so you, you could sets and maps canonicalize minus zero to zero in the key position. The, uh, there's potentially a different way of looking at it, which is that a map and a set aren't values in and of themselves. You know, they are they are kind of collection classes that give you a certain functionality. So I'm like, I'm, whereas a, a record or a tuple, you could say that's an actual value that I'm creating. As it, it's hard, it's very subjective. In my gut, it's like, if I put something in an array and putting something in an array changes it, it feels very different to if I try and store something in a map and the way that map is hashing it means that it, kind of actually doesn't store that exact value, it stores something else or it has different equality semantics. It's less, you know, it's, that's a, an implementation detail of how that collection decides to key things and return things as opposed to actually creating a value in the language. Is, it, is there a useful insight to be had that um, perhaps a, a tuple could contain the original value but, uh, but canonicalize it for the purposes of its own identity? That's what breaks. That means you can create uh, two objects that are actually different, <laughs> but that don't have, that have the same looking identity. <laughs> equal. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, perhaps I'd like to dig a little deeper into that. This is a, if that breaks, what consequence is that for real code? One example that I showed is that we need to be able to put uh, those things into a uh, weak map. Weak map would need to keep the same value semantics uh, because you want to be able to take out a proxy for the right thing. Um, and now that means you might put something into a weak map that's triple equal, uh, but you get it out and really isn't the same thing. Okay. Yeah. That, that's, that seems obviously bad. 
I think there were examples of people like using game engine, you know, and storing the position of things, and they decide to use a tuple to store the vector of the actors and items in their game. You know, and it can be important to store the difference between zero and minus zero if you're doing physics. You know, and you're working out which what's the current vector of the kind of this player, and you know, if suddenly you've swapped the sign you know, you're suddenly going to have something shooting off in the other direction. It w was the example given in the, that long thread, I think. So the, the issue there would be some code switching from a regular array to a tuple and not realizing there is a semantic difference for uh, zero and minus zero between the two. Yeah, I think that's what I was trying to get early with. I think the way this proposal, my guess on how people approach this proposal is that uh, tuples and records map to objects and arrays at like a very kind of high level in terms of how you would use them. And obviously visually they have similar literals as opposed to thinking that um, uh, records and tuples map to map like capital M map and a non-existent capital list thing in the library, which is, you know, arrays definitely don't change values when they're put in them. Uh, so I think it's more surprising, at least to me, and I feel other people, if records and tuples change the values because records and objects and arrays don't. Yeah, I think that there's a pretty strong case that there's a lot of existing code where they're using objects and arrays as if they were immutable and that they would very much like to turn those into immutable, actually immutable things and expect them this, this, that code to work. Did we get an algorithm that's differentiating negative zero and zero for a vector? That's uncommon. It's not something I've seen. The reason Kahan introduced uh, negative zero into floating point was because of numerical algorithms that he had in mind uh, uh, that, that would error in one direction or the other, accumulate error in one direction or the other or something. I'm not a numerical analyst. I don't really understand it. I sure wish he hadn't done it, but he did do it for the purpose of algorithms that he then uh, published and got in widespread use. It would um, be something good okay. to know if those affect JavaScript. Like just an example that relies on it being negative zero to err in the right direction. Um, really? Oh, sorry. Does somebody else have something? Yeah, Nicolo's had his hand up. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I didn't realize my hand was up. Uh, but anyway, I just want to say that maybe those algorithms can be actually implemented in JavaScript. So, I mean, there are different libraries doing numerical stuff in JavaScript, so I wouldn't surprise if some of them rely on zeros. Like there are different JavaScript libraries for math. Right. The thing I, um, I wanted to mention, like we're probably out of time, um, but coming all the way back to the opposite thing, I guess maybe we should bring this offline, Jordan, but um, something that occurs to me that maybe that the, the, the invariant breakage around objects with different like you know a negative zero in a place that a positive zero is on the other side like two records that are type of object that are objects quote unquote that triple equal to the same but they're not object is same um ignoring the fact that triple equal and object is are different um the 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 real gross part there is that you triple equal those two objects and if you access those two properties um like they are observably different um the interesting or like that, I guess a way to soften that invariant is that that's not really true for any object that has a getter for a property, right? Like, because a getter could return anything. So like, just because the object is equal to itself doesn't mean that every property on that object will be the same across every access. I mean, that's fair. And especially with proxies and stuff that can be different. I, I would say that like you could, if I wanted to come up with something generic and, and not do the rational thing and avoid those edge cases, I would probably say something about like 
object.get on property descriptors of it being sure. deeply like they are they are different this deeply equal yeah yeah totally um, the, all the reflections the object, object is is also still different in that case but i'm just making the point that like right. the general case of accessing those objects and observing their differences um is not strictly an invariant sorry what is not an invariant well, um, take if you have the example where you have two objects, um, two standard objects that are triple equal to each other, them being the exact same object, then um, you could make the case um, that I am attempting to disprove that all of the properties of said objects when you access them will be the same as well, like via the same operator. But that's okay. not strictly the case because an object could have a getter property that will return any value on every yeah. so or, could, or like or the shape and the values in the object will be will matched out random or whatever actually be yeah. the same even though they're triple equal the same right the the idea that the object that an unfrozen object's properties are stable uh, was never an invariant um, no but mark you could have a frozen object with a getter that returns math dot random yeah, and that's and 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 that's uh, that's yeah. the invariants for frozen objects are very strong. Uh, the right, but but given that they're two the same objects, if I do x triple equals y in the very next line, like modulo <laughs> getters that can do random things because I could choose to reflect and not invoke the getter, uh, they'll those two objects are indistinguishable because they're the same object currently, whether they're frozen or not. That that has no bearing on it. The, they they are the same object. Uh, the they're the same about, identity. The the issue about what about an object is invariant over time is very well defined by the object invariant. Sure. Okay. Right. But yeah. The the invariant that I am concerned with is that immediately before anything else has had any chance to mutate any aspect of that object and modulo getters like they're that means they're the same object and they're interchangeable and if yeah. there's an exists any case where they're not then that is right right concerning. i'm just I, I guess i'm i'm my point is to soften that um th that like yes they are still they are clearly obviously observable they do contain different values but that yeah we can add the qualifications about getters and stuff there and are less traps. cases in which you could observe the difference i guess is my point the the, sure. the, the interchangeable is the the really important point about object is which is if X object is Y, that means that if you take all occurrences of, of, of the value of X and substitute Y or vice versa, you can't mm -hmm. cause any observable change in computation. Uh, and the one we do have one exception to that, which helps clarify how strong the invariant is. Uh, the one exception is um, uh, the bits that a NAND serializes to. Right. right. Um, I... Uh, we are over time, um, and I hesitate to stop the meeting, but uh, if we continue, I could use a volunteer to take over for me as host. Um, and barring that, uh, it, it would be delighted to reconvene on the topic in the future. I, pr I propose we break. All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>